Hi everybody, my name is David Gully and I'm at Bentley University and this is the third of four videos on the Fed's balance sheet. In the first uh, two videos we looked at uh, the Fed's old pre-2008 balance sheet. Uh, the second video we looked at the Fed's new post-2008 balance sheet. This video looks at the impact of the change in the size and composition of the balance sheet on the economy. And in our fourth video we'll look at the uh, impact or the, uh, the Fed's change from a large balance sheet down to a smaller balance sheet, in other words the unwind. And for other videos, please see our YouTube channel. Well, as we talked about in the previous video, uh, the quantitative easing programs, the large-scale asset purchases, in other words, in central bank speak, dramatically increased the size of the Fed's balance sheet from a little over $800 billion to over $4.5 trillion, so roughly a quintupling. It also dramatically changed the composition of the balance sheet from mostly treasury bills and discount loans to banks to longer-term treasuries and to mortgage-backed securities. And so what we want to ask in this video is, well, how is quantitative easing supposed to work? And so it turns out the Fed has a, what's referred to as a dual mandate. They're required by law to try to cause the economy to achieve maximum sustainable employment and also stable prices as well. So when the QEs uh, were used, um, the intent was to increase both output and employment and to increase inflation back to the Fed's objective of around 2%. The reason they decided to do this, because at the time, unemployment was very high, very nearly 10%, and there was a risk of deflation, in other words, prices actually falling. So in effect, what was happening is that aggregate demand in the economy was very weak, and monetary policy can often be very helpful at increasing aggregate demand and increasing output and employment. And so what we want to look at here now to help us answer that question are what are referred to as transmission mechanisms. In other words, how might the QE programs affect aggregate demand in the economy? So I've got a list of seven different tran um, uh, transmission mechanisms here that might help explain how the Fed's uh, quantitative easing programs tended to impact aggregate demand and therefore impact output and employment. And so what we'll do is we'll go through all seven of these one at a time. And what we'll see is that all of these can be mutually reinforcing. In other words, they can all work together. So the first uh, transmission mechanism is through long-term interest rates. And so the idea here was that the Fed was buying longer-term treasury securities. Well, this will increase the demand for those securities. Their prices will tend to rise. And you'll have the inverse relationship between uh, bond prices and interest rates. And so interest rates will, will of course, tend to fall. And the key thing here is these are risk-free rates that will tend to fall. These lower risk-free rates, in turn, will be passed on to uh, lower other non-risk-free rates, such as mortgage rates, car loans, and so forth. Lower longer-term interest rates will tend to stimulate consumption spending and investment spending, which are two direct components of aggregate demand. And what's interesting here is there's what's known as a flow effect. In other words, this is the daily buying of treasuries and other securities by the Fed. So the Fed is, in other words, moving in the treasury market on a day-to-day -day basis, increasing demand. That's the flow effect. The stock effect is that over time, the Fed accumulated a large stock of these assets, as we've seen already. And this accumulated large stock is, in effect, pulled off the market so that these treasuries are permanently scarce, leading to a lower interest rate than would otherwise exist. And this is important to note because when the Fed stopped buying uh, the securities, when the QE program stopped, interest rates, <coughs> excuse me, did not skyrocket, and they didn't skyrocket because of this stock effect. Another impact is that uh, the uh, purchases may end up uh, reducing the value of the U.S. dollar. So to the extent that the QE programs were successful at increasing aggregate demand and successful at lowering interest rates, we might observe higher economic growth and higher inflation. Well, these three things, lower rates, higher growth, and higher inflation, could all work together to reduce the value of the dollar. So, for example, suppose that interest rates in the U.S. fall compared to interest rates in other countries. This makes U.S. financial assets less attractive compared to other financial assets in different countries. And so there will be a decrease in the demand for U.S. dollars to acquire these less desirable U.S. assets. That decrease in demand for dollars will tend to push the value of the dollar down. So as the dollar falls relative to other currencies, that makes everything priced in dollars suddenly cheaper to people in the rest of the world. So what this will tend to do in turn is to increase exports, and reduce imports, because now suddenly things priced in units of foreign currency are more expensive for people in the U.S. 
So you have this double impact of working to increase exports and decreasing imports and other things equal, those would tend to increase aggregate demand. Now, however, thanks to very complex uh, supply chains, this effect might not be as uh, important as it used to be. So for example, in the US, even a, a, a something that is manufactured uh, in the US will have a large component of foreign uh, parts in it. And those foreign parts, uh, of course, must be imported. And so it's not clear to the extent to which a change in the value of the dollar will have the impact on demand, at least as much as it used to. Another uh, effect was to increase or improve the housing market. And so here, in several of its QE programs, the Fed directly bought mortgage-backed securities. And the idea here was to increase or improve liquidity in this market and also to reduce uh, mortgage interest rates. And what will happen here is that as the Fed is effect effectively a ready buyer for mortgage-backed securities, that would incentivize uh, banks and other mortgage originators to originate these mortgages and then sell them to the Fed knowing that the Fed stands ready to buy these. Now what's important to note here is that in order to be eligible for purchase that the, the credit standards had to be pretty high. So they simply couldn't sell any old mortgage-backed security to the Fed. Lower mortgage rates in turn caused by a more liquid secondary market and a higher demand from the Fed will tend to push mortgage rates down and lower mortgage rates will tend to encourage home buyers. And if we have more home buyers, this will be an increase in demand for housing. And this other things equal will tend to push up housing prices. And this, is, of course, is important because houses are the largest single asset for most people. Also, another intent of the QE programs were to improve the functioning of credit markets. In fact, Ben Bernanke has referred to the QE programs as credit easing. And so think about it like this. So during the Great, Depre the, uh, Great Recession, banks and other lending institutions dramatically reduced the volume of their lending. And when lending declines, consumption and investment will decline along with it simply because uh, some forms of consumption and a lot of investment are financed by borrowing. And so if quantitative easing through the various channels we're discussing here can improve the economy, this will increase the overall health of financial institutions, including banks. So for example, uh, in an improving economy, there will be fewer loan defaults and other things equal. This will encourage banks and other financial institutions to increase the volume of lending. And once there's additional lending in the economy, this will tend to support uh, aggregate demand through increasing consumption and increasing investment. So in other words, this is the, the credit channel uh, that Ben Bernanke is referring to. In other words, credit easing. Another effect is what's referred to as portfolio rebalancing. As we've already seen earlier, the QE programs could reduce risk-free interest rates, like, for example, on Treasury securities. Well, when this happens, uh, uh, buyers of these securities will face low returns. And so what they might do is they might look at those low returns, find them undesirable, and look for other risky assets in order to achieve a desired uh, risk return profile. And so buyers or potential buyers would move into these riskier assets. That'd be an increase in demand for these assets. That would tend to push those interest rates down a little bit. This in turn would encourage issuers of these riskier assets, you know, corporations and banks and so forth, to issue more of these securities. And then these proceeds can be used to fund investment and other spending. And this will, of course, in turn work to increase aggregate demand. We also have the wealth effect. So if we have quantitative easing working through all the channels we're discussing here, this might work to increase aggregate demand. And if this is successful, then we might observe output in the economy increasing and employment in the economy increasing as well. So if we have this combined with lower interest rates, and of course lower interest rates will be correlated with higher bond prices, what we might observe is an increase in uh, stock prices. In other words, an increase in the stock market. We might also according to our previous discussion, see an increase in housing prices. And if we put these together, if we have bond prices rising, stock prices rising, and housing prices rising, this will tend to increase wealth in the economy. And not surprisingly, an increase in wealth can tend to increase consumption, which would, of course, directly impact aggregate demand. Finally, what we might observe is an improved improvement in confidence. The uh, public at large, if they're not uh, uh, happy or satisfied or feeling good about the state of the economy, they might pull back on their consumption. Likewise, firms, if they're feeling pessimistic, they might pull back on their investment, and that might tend to work to reduce aggregate demand. And so if the Fed's QE programs 
along with improved and enhanced communication by Fed officials, if this can boost confidence, then that alone can help boost or at least maintain aggregate demand. And so what we can show here is um, now sort of the combined effects of all of these using a standard aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. So first, on the vertical axis, remember we have as a review, we have the aggregate price level in the economy. On the horizontal axis, we have real GDP. The long-run aggregate supply curve gives us the normal maximum sustainable capacity that the economy can produce given resources. And so if we look at a situation like this, at something like point A, this might represent the state of the economy in 2009, for example. And so here you can see we would be very far below full employment. So that's 2009 real GDP. And this is indicative of a recession. And so the Fed introduced the QE programs. The intent is through the mechanisms we just talked about is to shift the aggregate demand curve back to the right like so. And that tends to work to move output and employment back to its full employment level. And this is the intent in terms of increasing output and employment and also noticing on the vertical axis an increase in the price level, so this would also help tend to increase inflation. Now, of course, we don't want to in in increase inflation too much, but we certainly do want to avoid deflation. And so a quick summary here is that the Fed's uh, various asset purchases were intended uh, to increase demand in the economy through a whole wide variety of channels that we just discussed. And the empirical evidence says that, yes, this did in fact happen. But it turns out there's a pretty wide range of disagreement in terms of the magnitude. So the general consensus is that the Fed was not able to fully offset the Great Recession, but was able to offset at least a reasonable fraction of it. And other central banks, such as the ECB, the European Central Bank, uh, the Bank of Japan, the BOJ, and the BOE, the Bank of England, they have all also uh, engaged in their own various QE programs. Thank you very much.